I want to welcome those of you who have already joined. Thank you so much. I think we're going to give it just one more minute and we will get started. Okay. Hi, everybody. Thank you all so much for joining today. I'm really excited to have all of you here so that we can have a conversation about how all of us can hold our candidates accountable during this wild and extremely important election. Um, and believe it or not, we are exactly tonight, one month away from election day. The time we live in right now is intense. And so I really appreciate all of you for slowing down for a few moments to learn about the many ways that we can engage with a campaign during the month of October. Over the next hour, we're going to talk about the importance of engaging with a candidate while they are campaigning the different ways you can do this. And of course, we will talk about voting, a topic that I'm sure you all have been hearing a lot about from various organizations and community leaders. I don't know about all of you, but I know I've definitely been receiving a lot of text messages and emails telling me to make sure I'm registered, make sure I have a plan to vote, and we will be having some of that conversation later um, in this webinar. Our constituents all over the country have been working really hard and creatively to not only have their own voices heard, but to also empower their family, their peers, and their communities. This isn't just about empowering yourself to make your voice heard and get out there to vote. Um, maybe you need that, and that's why you've logged on to this webinar, and I really hope that you can feel empowered to do so by the end of it. But maybe you're here because there's someone in your life that you definitely need to have a conversation with um, to get them more involved in this electoral process. And hopefully we can give you the tools to do that as well. Now, before we really dive in, um, there are some housekeeping matters like we always have um, now that we are over Zoom um, most of the time. So first of all, I want to encourage you all to be asking questions in the chat. Justin is our tech person tonight, and he will be monitoring the chat to make sure that everyone's questions are answered. I'll be looking at it as well. So hopefully we don't miss anything. Um, and I really want to encourage you all to ask questions throughout, since I will be stopping every once in a while to answer them. Or um, if it's not a question, you just have a comment, you want to tell us about something that you've done, maybe something resonated with you, I want to hear that as well. This is all part of a conversation. Um, and if for some reason I don't get to answer your question or this webinar is over and uh, another question pops into your head, we will be sending out a follow up email and you can respond to that email with any questions that you might have. Like I said, this is part of a larger conversation that the whole country is having right now. So I'm really excited to engage with you all on this important topic. Um, and not just tonight, but, you know, continuing the conversation after we're all done here. So moving on to what happens if you have tech issues. I hope that you do not. 
But if you do experience any tech issues, make sure that you are writing that in the chat function as well. Like I said, Justin is our guy on tech tonight and he should be able to help you out. Um, if you click on the chat function, there's a drop down menu and you can click on his name, Justin, um, and send him a private message to ask if, the, um, you know, to see if he can help you out with, with your tech issues. But once you are ready to continue commenting to the group or asking questions, make sure that you are changing that drop down menu back to say everyone so that uh, we can, in fact, see your questions and other comments. Um, and so once you're done fixing whatever tech issue you might have, make sure that you are doing that. Okay, now let's move on to who I am and why you are all here. So first, I wanna encourage you to please introduce yourself in the chat right now. Take a moment to get in the chat and just give me your name, what state you're from, and if it's even possible to choose one issue that you really care about, share that as well. If not, let us know why you joined this webinar, what is important to you right now, and why do you wanna engage in this election season? So please get in the chat, introduce yourself, and I will go ahead and start. My name is Larissa. I'm the Young Adult Advocacy Coordinator at FCNL. Um, I live in DC currently, although I am originally from Pennsylvania. And I would say that my big issue right now is definitely immigration, um, both on a personal level, but also on a professional level. I am working on immigration um, with a group of awesome people from around the country. And you'll hear a little bit more about that later. Um, but that is one reason why I'm, I'm really uh, right now deeply working on immigration. So I mentioned I work at FCNL. This is an FCNL webinar. What is FCNL? FCNL is the Friends Committee on National Legislation, and we are a nonpartisan Quaker lobbying organization that works on issues of peace and justice. And we've been working on training young adults all over the country to speak to their legislators about their values and their concerns. And we have been so excited to see just how many of us are making sure that the young adult voice is heard in the policymaking process. Now, we usually talk about the policymaking process um, with legislators that are already in office, right? Uh, we oftentimes train all of our constituents, specifically young adults, since that is the network I work with, we train them on how to engage with legislators that are in office currently as they sit in the policymaking process. But what I'm here today to talk about is more of the agenda setting process. There is another way to make your voice heard when policy is being decided. And that is at the very, very, very beginning of that process. And that is just during the period of time where decisions are being made about what to focus on. And so that's what we're talking about today. This upcoming election is going to determine a lot of things. And you know, not only will it determine who our leader is, who our leaders are, it will determine how we continue to respond to the COVID-19 crisis, but also it will determine what issues are prioritized and addressed in 2021. As soon as that new Congress starts, what policy will they be talking about? What legislation are they gonna try to be passing? Um, and that is something that we can be a part of. So the agenda is being set now. And as one of my coworkers likes to say, candidates and members of Congress are at their most accessible right now. They want to hear from you and they want to know what their constituents care about this election season. So after this webinar is over, I hope that we will have been able to give you a couple different ways to engage with candidates. And um, in the follow-up email that I will probably be referencing a couple times, you will all receive a way to easily report back to us if you are able to engage with a candidate. Um, you will be able to let us know so that we can keep working together, FCNL and you all as constituents, um, to keep 
holding a can uh, legislators and candidates accountable. So what exactly do we mean when we say engaging with candidates? There's a couple ways to do this. So hold tight. Uh, we are going to cover a lot of information. So first things first, what does it mean to engage? Um, what exactly are we expecting you to say or ask? Um, there's a lot of different ways to engage with a campaign. You can volunteer with a campaign. Um, you can obviously vote, and we'll talk about that later. Now, we are a nonpartisan organization, and we are a national organization. So where we focus specifically is the um, House of Representatives and the seats that are up for election there, and the Senate and the seats that are up for election there. Um, as well as the president. So at a national level, what legislators and what candidates can we be talking to? Um, and because we are nonpartisan, we want to talk to all candidates and we want to know where they stand on certain issues. Um, so FCNL has put together a couple suggestions that we like to call our questions for candidates. And these are questions that are meant to do a couple things. So first of all, they will make clear our position on certain issues. Um, and second, that making it clear might actually also provide some pressure and continue to make it clear that, okay, it's not just me that cares about this. I, Larissa, am not just me, Larissa, I'm also a constituent. I'm someone you represent. I'm someone in your district. I'm someone in your state. And this is something I care about. So I want you to care about it as well. And I hope that you do. Um, finally, by asking these questions, you are asking the candidate to be clear about where they stand on those same issues. Um, so Justin, just put the link to our questions for candidates page in the chat. And if you click on the link, you can see that there are one or two questions for all of our issues. And below each question, you can also see FCNL's position on the issue to understand why we chose the question that we did. We obviously want you to know more of the details of, of why we took certain positions. Um, so I'm just gonna talk about one of these questions for candidates as an example. So the Advocacy Corps, which is my lovely group of community organizers, absolutely love working with them. Um, this is our young adult community organizing program, and they are currently focused on immigration legislation. They are focused on passing HR 6, which is the Dream and Promise Act. And this provides a pathway to citizenship for undocumented youth and other immigrant groups that do not currently have a path to lawful permanent resident status or citizenship. Now this bill in 2019 already passed the House. It, it did not then pass the Senate, it passed the House and then it did not move any further and that's part of what we're, we're trying to advocate for. But as soon as a new Congress has been elected and is in session, that work will have to be done again. And the best way to make sure that that work is happening is to have candidates and legislators hearing about it now. So you can see here that the question we came up with for this specific policy topic goes like this. Do you support legislation establishing a pathway to citizenship for undocumented immigrants who came to the US as children and grew up in our country? If so, will you make sure that such legislation doesn't come at the cost of other immigrant groups? With a larger um, movement of community advocates and organizations dedicated to immigration, you are not gonna be the only person asking this question and you're not gonna be the only person making this a priority for Congress. So I really want you to view what you can do here as contributing to the pressure that's being put on candidates to support a pathway to citizenship. And you would be contributing to the pressure to get it passed again in the House in 2021 and hopefully this time also passed in the Senate as well and signed into law. And this goes for any of the issues that you see listed on our site. 
Um, you are adding your voice and making the movement louder and stronger. The more people we have asking these questions and lobbying on these issues, the more likely it is that we see related legislation made a priority by the new Congress. So like I said, we have questions on many of our different issues. I would love it if you all went and checked it out. This will be in the follow-up and you can see what issue is important to you and what question we suggest asking. So where and how can you ask these questions? We have many ways to do this on our website and you will see the whole list of possibilities in this follow-up email this glorious follow-up email, uh, but I am going to focus on three ways that you can ask these questions. So I'm going to talk about social media, letters to the editor, and campaign events slash town halls. So you can maybe guess that they get a little bit harder in terms of logistics and in terms of time, right? Social media is going to be the easiest and fastest way to engage with the candidate. Talking at a town hall or even setting up a town hall will definitely be the most time consuming, potentially the harder option in terms of logistics, but absolutely doable. And we are going to hear in a bit from someone that was able to help make this happen. And, and hopefully you can all learn from her experience. But let's start with social media. I highly recommend just generally following your members of Congress on social media particularly Twitter. This way you can keep up to date on their latest statements or activity that can be really helpful in your communication with them, your advocacy. Legislators are increasingly using social media to communicate with their constituents. Um, it's, it's a really direct way of having their voice heard by a lot of people. Um, now, if the candidate is not an incumbent, so they're not already in office, they're not rerunning for a seat that they already fill, um, they might not have had like a public, uh, public official type of Twitter account or social media page. But since they're running, they most likely created an account and you can definitely find them that way. Um, and you shouldn't have a problem doing that research and finding some form of social media where they're communicating. Another good way to keep in touch with a campaign and just kind of keep track of what they're doing and where their events might be um, is by getting on their email lists and um, they will hopefully be letting you know when there are events and things like that. Um, but what can you do on social media exactly? So you can ask these questions that I just talked about by commenting on a post from a candidate. You can create an original post. And if you do that, either way, you should absolutely tag the candidate or the campaign to make sure that they see it. Because they will. They are on the lookout. They want to be talking to their constituents and they're running for a seat in Congress. They will definitely be keeping track of what their constituents are saying about them or to them. And so make sure you're tagging your members of Congress on social media if you are just, you know, tweeting out this question and, and uh, requesting that they, that they answer it or that they make a statement about that issue. Um, so the next thing I want to talk about is letters to the editor. And this is another form of media. So I see a question, what is tagging? So tagging is a way that you can basically um, include, uh, it's almost like you shout them out so that in, on their phone or on their computer, they get a notification that says, hey, someone just mentioned your name in a tweet and they specifically called you out for it. Like they called you out by name and by your username. And so a notification will pop up letting them know that they have been mentioned and that they should go check that out. And the way that you tag someone is, I think, consistently on any social media platform, you click on the at symbol and um, then you just type in their name and it'll come up with some options where you can very easily click on them and that will be tagging them. Um, so let's go back to LTEs. Thank you for that question. Um, I lost my train of thought. Let's see, what was I saying? Oh, okay, yes, yeah. so another form of media. Um, now, this form of media is a little more traditional. Um, you are 
writing to a publication and it is another form of using the media to amplify your voice and your message. So I have an example here of an LTE that was written by members of one of our amazing advocacy teams, another awesome advocacy program that we have. Um, and they are focusing on the issue of the AUMF. Um, so a lot of our programs will focus on one issue and this is their issue right now. And that is the authorization for the use of military force. So if you look down towards the bottom of the LTE, what they wrote to their candidates is, we think a fair request for West Virginia's federal candidates in the upcoming election is to ask them to clearly articulate their positions on congressional war powers, repealing the current AUMFs and on a pledge against war with Iran unless debated and authorized by Congress. So you can see here that it's not really a question, right? Our question that we have in our questions for candidates page is similar. It is asking, will you vote for repeal of the 2001 AUMF? Um, but they don't necessarily ask it as a question in the letter. They um, kind of stick to a more, I guess, um, you know, they're making a statement rather than asking a question, but they're still imploring, uh, you know, to the candidates, hey, you should definitely be making this clear where you stand on this issue. So you can see that this still serves the same purpose. They still use that guideline. They're still engaging with the campaign. They're still requesting a clear stance on an issue, but they were a little more creative with the format. And so you can see that there isn't just one way to utilize our questions for candidates resource. Um, and at the end of the LTE, what I'll say is, you know, there will be a resource sent out for how you can write an LTE. They're really short. Um, it shouldn't take you too long. And like I said, this is a way that you can amplify your voice and amplify your message. At the end of the LTE, you'll be doing something similar that you did with the social media. You should be saying the candidates by name, actually naming them. Um, and by including the names, you can basically guarantee that congressional or campaign staff will see it and take note of it. They do keep track of when their names appear in the media. So you think you're only one person screaming into a void. No, they are absolutely keeping track of when they show up in the media and what their constituents are saying about them. Um, so this is one of those ways that you can make your voice heard and, and your LTE could end up in a briefing for a member of Congress, letting them know, hey, this is what's going on in your district or in your state. Um, like I said, there's going to be a resource for how to write LTEs. I could literally do a whole other webinar on how to do that. Um, but um, I want to emphasize that they aren't long at all. This is a really short piece and they shouldn't be too difficult to put together. So before I continue, um, are there any questions about LTEs or social media and how to use them effectively to engage with a candidate? I will be answering questions again later. So if I don't see anything now, I'll move on and wait and see if there are any questions again at the end. Okay. All right. So at this point, I want to talk about attending a town hall or doing a campaign event or something like that. And for that, I'm going to invite my friend Nnedi to join me. Um, Nnedi, I am so happy that you can be here to talk to us about how you managed actually to very effectively engage with the campaign and um, make your, your issue a priority for them. So first, can you tell us who you are besides my friend Nnedi? Um, and then we'll move on to, to our other questions. Sure. Hi, Larissa, and hi, everyone. My name is Nettie, and I'm really happy to be here today. Um, so I am, like Larissa said, part of the Advocacy Corps, and we are working on 
immigration reform or HR6, which is the Dream and Promise Act. And yes, thank you for having me today. Thank you. Yeah, so she's one of our amazing organizers from the Advocacy Corps program that I've mentioned a couple times working on immigration. Um, and Nevi, can you talk to us about what exactly you did? What candidate did you engage with and what did you do? Also, where are you geographically? <laughs> sure. Yeah, so I am in Southern California, so San Diego, California, and my race, we basically have this candidate, his name's Mark Kevin Ajar, and he's been running since 2018. And he's been for the, um, you know, allowing undocumented immigrants to be in this country and a pathway to citizenship is how he originally had started his campaign. However, after a couple of, and just to kind of give a, a little bit more background, our San Diego has a lot of undocumented uh, people here and I myself, I'm a DACA recipient, so this is a deeply personal issue for me. And so that's how he had started off. Um, however, recently we have noticed that he is, um, has been a little bit more hesitant to support um, immigrant rights and has kind of shifted his platform. Um, in order to have a wider range of, I guess, um, different, I don't know, appeal to different people. How, so my friend who was the president of um, the Escondido Young Dems um, pretty much reached out to me and a group of friends as just friends to um, kind of tackle this issue and kind of remind him of the things that he had stood for in the beginning and to ensure that his position on, you know, a pathway to citizenship for undocumented immigrants in general or for undocumented youth would um, be possible without the ne necessarily having a border wall, right? To keep things clean for undocumented immigrants. And so she reached out to the director um, of the campaign and she told them pretty much, we are a group of you know concerned young adults who really want to ensure that your campaign is sticking to what they said they would, right? Um, especially because so many of us are affected by this. Um, most of my friends, if not all I believe, are um, have parents who um, are immigrants or they're immigrants themselves. And so I think that's one of the recent reasons we decided that this was something that we had to approach. And yes, so we approached him. That's great. And so how many people did you Just say... How many people did you say had actually um, managed to join you for this event? And it was all virtual, right? Yeah, so this was a virtual event and it was pretty much just my, my friends and I just deciding that we really needed to do something about this. So it was eight of us and we talked about different issues that were prevalent to um, our community. So it wasn't just specifically immigration. But because that specific topic was really important for us, that did, we did manage to make that a very big talking point. And yeah, part of it was reiterating like, hey, so um, can you ensure that what you're saying is going to be true? So like not giving money for the border wall or um, ensuring that HR6, the Dream and Promise Act would be something that you would support in the future. That, and yes. That's awesome, thanks Nnedi. And were you, okay, one last question, I think, unless I come up with another one. Were you nervous at all? Did this feel intimidating to you? Like how, what, was the, what was the atmosphere like? Did it feel like you were being listened to whenever you, you raised this concern and, and set up this, this event? Sure. So I think I was kind of nervous just given that, you know, you're talking to someone who might eventually be a legislative official, you know, <laughs> someone who's going to represent you. But I think I was kind of reminded of like the bigger picture and what, you know, this person has the possibility of doing. And so I think that definitely calmed my nerves a little bit. And it was also great that I had the backup of my own friends, right, ha you know, holding me together and making sure that you know, I felt uh, connected and comforted and it was just great to have that presence, even though it was like, whether it had been, um, you know, not, it was a uh, Zoom meeting, but you know, regardless, if we were not in the pandemic, had it been like an actual town hall where we all got to meet, I think the fact that we were together really helped um, calm my nerves. But yes, it was a very um, good discussion. 
I think he was receptive and I think he learned something from it because he wasn't, he hadn't realized that funding the wall meant no longer having a clean dream act. So, you know, it was at the expense of other um, undocumented immigrants coming to the country. And I think that really opened up discussion, right? As to like, how can I better make sure that we can create policies that are going to help us in the future, right? And not necessarily affect other people and take into consideration that we are a large uh, population of people who would be affected by things like, um, you know, having a border wall or things like that. Um, so yeah, and it was great. That's awesome. Thank you so much for sharing, Nedi, and thank you for, yeah. Um, yeah, sharing your expertise and your story. I, there's a couple things I wanna highlight from what Nedi said. You know, they reached out to the campaign. Um, so there's different ways that you can engage in an event. Um, like I said, if you're on social media or you get on their email list, you'll find out when there are events. But you can take matters into your own hands and you can reach out to the campaign. Um, I think Nettie said the director of the campaign and say, hey, this is a very important issue to constituents in your area. We'd love to host a town hall where we can talk about this and we know you're running for um, this seat. So we'd love for us to have a conversation between the community and you as a candidate. That's obviously very effective and they made it happen. So that is really great. Um, and this is a more high level, probably maybe more time, more effort, um, but very fulfilling. And if you make it happen, it can obviously be really fun and you can invite other people and you can really bring others into this conversation. So thank you, Nedi, for joining us. Sure. Can I say one last thing? Just Please. Quickly? Okay, cool. Yeah. And I think it was great because he was able to prioritize the things that he really felt were important, right? Because he was talking about young people, he was like, oh my gosh, you know, they're really trying to make a difference for their own community. So I think it incentivizes any candidate to decide to, you know, really listen to you and pay attention to your own needs. So yes, thank you for having me on today, tonight. What I especially found um, interesting was about when you said, oh, you know, they, he, that this candidate didn't even actually know a specific detail about immigration legislation. So this is an example, I think, of our role sometimes as constituents and as, as residents of their district and their states is to let them know what's going on. And if they don't, if they're running for the first time, they might not have all of that information, but we as community advocates and leaders, we might have that information. So thank you, Nedi, for sharing again, but thank you also for making sure that your candidates know what you care about and and know better how to handle immigration policy because of you so thanks sure thank you yep see ya bye all right so i'll just quickly summarize before moving on to voting what we've talked about so far we talked about social media we talked about ltes and we talked about engaging in a campaign event or a town hall even virtual, they are still happening. And so I hope that you all have some ideas going in your heads about how you can make this happen um, for your candidates or your community. But I want to end our time together by talking about probably the most straightforward and also you, the thing you might hear the most about right now um, in terms of being part of this election season, and that is voting. So if you are eligible to vote, casting your ballot is critical. Over the last couple months, we have been working with young adults around the country to get people registered to vote. Um, at this point, believe it or not, we are in the middle of an election. Some people have already voted, which blows my mind. And some people have just registered to vote for the first time ever. We are all on very different pages right now, all kind of leading towards November 3rd, right? Um, and that's really impressive to me. It's very, it's very wild, I think, for me to wrap my head around that. So how can we navigate all of this to ensure that we are heard and that our communities are also heard? Um, we need to make a plan to vote. Honestly, that is number one. If you've already convinced yourself you are voting, 
Voting is important. Yes. Larissa, you don't have to convince me any more of that. I'm ready. And so the next step is how are you going to vote? Mm -hmm. Some of you that are here with us might already have a plan to vote. And if you do, please share it in the chat. It'd be really great to see how we're all uh, going to cast our, our, our ballot um, for November 3rd. Um, but for those of you who don't have a plan yet, or maybe like I mentioned earlier, there's that one person in your life that just doesn't wanna make a plan. Maybe they don't even wanna vote. Um, but I'm here to give you the steps that you need to have that conversation with that person. So the first step in making a plan is to go to this website that you see right here. It's called fcnl.org slash vote. So step number one in making a plan is go to fcnl.org slash vote. And here you can either register for the first time or check your registration. Um, the register button for the first time registrations can also be used to update a registration if you moved or something like that. Um, so if someone has already registered to vote and they insist that they've done it, like you don't have to keep talking to me about it, I've definitely registered, I really encourage you to take them over to the check registration button. Um, with so many people relying on absentee and mail-in ballots, you do not want to have the wrong address in your voter registration. Um, you know, just a couple days ago, I was outside checking the mail with my roommates, and I realized that there were three ballots in the mailbox. None of those ballots were for any of the people that lived in this house. They had all been sent to people that had lived here before, but are not here any longer. And that terrified me, because what that means is that those three people didn't receive their ballots. They're gonna have to request another one and that might take them even longer to fill it out and send it out. Um, so we definitely wanna avoid that happening. Um, so the last thing that you see on this uh, site, it's not technically part of the plan, but where you see pledge now, get friends to vote. I would encourage you to click on this and you are given the option to commit three people to voting. So if you're already on this website, I would go ahead and commit three people to voting. And what that means is they don't get anything. You're not signing them up for anything. You will get a text with those people's names and it will serve as a reminder to talk to them about their plan. So if you're on this website right now, I really hope that you all are clicking pledge now and typing in three names because we all need reminders to do things sometimes. And imagine how much we can amplify this conversation by committing to talking to three people each. Now there are 21 pledges there. Um, that means that already 63 people that are not in our immediate network are being brought into this conversation. And I personally think that that's pretty cool. So this is a really cool feature that is that is on this website. So first step, fcnl.org slash vote. Is your registration actually in order? Second step, <clears throat> excuse me, is figuring out what the laws are in your state. We'll send you a resource that you can use to check out what options you have in your state. Um, one example of why this is going to be extremely important is my own state of Pennsylvania has a law that if you mail in a ballot and you do not put your ballot into what they call the secrecy envelope, so the second envelope that's inside of the first one, if it's not in both envelopes, if you only put it in the one, they will not count your ballot. And if I hadn't checked that, I wouldn't have known. And when my ballot comes in and I send it out, I might have made that mistake. So you should definitely be making sure that you know what the laws are in your state. Um, if you choose to request a ballot um, instead of voting in person on the day of the election, then you can also do that through this resource. There's a giant button that says request ballot. There are so many ways to be voting in this election, and that is the third step in making a plan. Third step is figuring out exactly how you're going to do it. So I personally have requested a ballot 
that um, will, I'm assuming, be mailed to me. I'm assuming it is in the process of reaching me right now. Um, and as soon as it gets here, I will be filling it out and sending it back. But there's many different ways that we can be voting. Um, just yesterday, a coworker sent me a picture of her and her kids um, submitting their ballots at one of our mail drop-off locations here in DC. There are people who are waiting until November 3rd to actually show up and vote in person. If you do that, please wear a mask, stay distanced, and be safe. There are many ways. You just have to figure out what is going to be the best for you. And that is the third step of the plan. The fourth step, which I'm not going to make an official step, but I'm going to say it's the fourth step, is to just have some fun with it. Maybe take a picture of yourself casting your ballot. Um, another coworker of mine actually uh, basically filmed her entire trek over to the mailbox to put her ballot in there. And I loved watching every second of it because if we're sharing these stories with each other and getting each other pumped up and excited about voting, that's really what's going to make a big difference is the talking that we all do um, with each other and with our friends. So all of that was assuming that someone has already decided, yes, I'm going to vote. And now I just need a plan. What happens if someone doesn't want to vote? Um, someone might need to be convinced that their vote does actually matter or that it is definitely worth their time to be putting in this effort. Listen to those people and find out why they feel that way. Do they not know where to get started? Well, now you know the, stage, uh, the steps to helping them make a plan. Do they not think that their vote will matter? I hear that one a lot, and I actually recently heard something that was really interesting to me. Um, I found out that in 2016, Michigan's average winning margin for the presidential election was about two votes per precinct. Those numbers blew my mind. Only two votes, and those could be any of our votes. So it's clear that we can all play a role in this process. Um, Another reason that voter turnout might be low or someone doesn't want to vote is because people are concerned that voting won't be effective in addressing crises such as the pandemic, economic collapse, police brutality, and systemic racism. And to this, I say that we have to approach with a yes and strategy. Yes, protest. Yes, organize a Twitter storm. Yes, engage with your candidates. Let them know what you care about and what they should be prioritizing. But at the same time, make sure that you're voting. Sometimes people are sure that they want to vote and they don't know who to vote for. There's a lot of categories of this. Um, that is another way <clears throat> that our approach to engaging with candidates and campaigns can be helpful. So not only are you telling them what you care about by asking if they support a pathway to legal status and citizenship, by asking if they will repeal the AUMF, by asking if they will do what you want them to do. So not only are you making sure you're being heard, but hopefully you will then find out more about what they care about. And that is really important for us as we make our decisions. Who do we want to vote for? It's going to be a hard decision if we don't know what the candidates stand for. And so engaging with them, uh, listening to them, you know, reading their Twitter or their other social medias is going to be a good way to figure out where they stand on those issues. So I'm going to pause and see if there are any questions or comments about anything that I've said so far. And I'll give it a second just to see if anyone wants to hop in the chat. Remember that you can also tell us what is your plan for voting. Um, and if you haven't introduced yourself yet, you can still do that now. Oh, amazing. It looks like someone in the chat was on exactly the same wavelength that I was in. Um, so thank you, Jim, for saying, um, I'll just read some of what you wrote here. I feel that in addition to encouraging citizens to register and vote, 
we should also strongly recommend that citizens engage in thorough research on candidate opinions and positions. That is wonderful advice. And there are many ways that you can do that, um, not just the ways that I was just mentioning. I see, Jim, that you've also suggested developing a spreadsheet, uh, reviewing their records. If they have already been in office and they're running for the same seat, or another one, but the point is they've already been in office, figure out what they've voted for. What have they supported in the past? Um, he also says, look at what legislation they have written, not just supported. Yes, Jim, you're saying very good things. I so appreciate this contribution. That's great. Thank you so much for sharing that. So as I'm waiting to see if anyone else wants to uh, contribute as well, I'm going to just uh, give you all, I guess, a summary of what you can do after this webinar and remind you all that not only will you be getting a bunch of resources from us right after this, including the register to vote page, the um, page about state laws, you'll get the questions for candidates page to see all of our different questions. Um, you will also be receiving a recording of this webinar. And I really hope that either you watch it again um, to refresh some of what you heard or you share it with your family members, your friends, your peers. But there are two things that I hope you can do as soon as we're done, there are two, oh, actually, I could come up with a lot of different things you could do, but I'll say a couple. So first, get on those email lists, get on those social media pages, figure out what your candidates are saying and if they're hosting any events that you can potentially be part of. Definitely get yourself on those lists so that you get the information you need. There is no perfect way of figuring out when these things are happening, but that is the best way is to wait and see what the campaigns are releasing, like what information and events that they're releasing. If you don't want to take Nettie's approach and try and um, set one up for yourself. And the second thing that I want you all to do is talk to someone, anyone about making a plan to vote. Um, it could be your spouse. It could be your um, niece. It could be the students in your classroom. It could be your roommates. I use my roommates since I'm stuck at home in this pandemic like a lot of us. My roommates are my example for a lot of things right now. Um, and they are definitely the people that hear the most about voting and why they should be voting this year. Um, so have a conversation with someone about making sure they have their plan to vote. If you don't have one yourself, you can be that person. Make that plan yourself. And second, get yourself on those lists or on social media to figure out when um, these different events might be happening. I'll give it just another second to see if there's anyone else that wants to contribute or um, ask a question. All right, it looks like I will just close us off by really emphasizing we as constituents, as residents of our respective districts and states have the potential to be part of the policy making process. We don't have to be in office in order to be part of the policy making process. We can be lobbying our legislators and we can be engaging with them while they are running for office to make sure that when they reach office, if they do, that they are prioritizing the issues that we care about. We have the power to set the agenda for the new Congress. Leadership is on the ballot. Our issues are on the ballot. The pandemic response is on the ballot. The economy is on the ballot. There's so much on the ballot right now. Find out what you really care about and, and, you know, let that inspire you to continue doing this work and to talk to others about making sure that they are doing this work as well. Thank you all for joining and I'm really excited to help set some uh, priorities for Congress with all of you. It was great to have you all tonight and I'll 
should, I'm sure, be hearing from all of you again really soon, or you'll be hearing from me. Thank you all. Thank you.